Batman the White Knight issue number one of eight. So when I first heard of this, I thought basically DC was going the SJW Marvel route. Uh, but they're not. Uh, this is actually a really damn good series. I wouldn't even say it's pushing any kind of social justice politics. At least issue one isn't. But there is some social commentary in it. But it's done really well. And it's not like ham-fisted in your face. Like it's nice and subtle. And I think, you know, if you want to have any kind of politics or any kind of like social commentary, that's the best way to do it. Like don't just blast it in your consumer's face, but just like little nice touches. But keep it like very, uh, you know, low key. It's like the best way to, to pull it off, I, I would say. So yeah, uh, I decided just to pick up this. I don't even want to say I picked this up to roast it, but I guess I just picked it up to see how it would go because I heard... Basically, one side kind of seemed like it was going to be going the SJW route. The other side said it was going to be almost like a satire in SJWs. So I was like, all right, I don't know. It seemed, the story itself seemed kind of interesting with uh, the Joker basically reforming and becoming good while Batman like, is not necessarily evil, but he's not like the good hero that everyone makes him out to be. I thought that was kind of interesting. So I picked it up and I'm glad I did. It's actually a really good series. So we start off with the Batmobile driving towards, uh, I believe it's Arkham. And the police are out front to greet him, and the driver. And they bring the driver down to one of the cells. And inside the cell, we see Batman uh, in his costume and everything. I thought that was kind of interesting, though. The fact that, uh, <laughs> that Batman is still in his costume. Like, you would think like even if he's in jail, they would like you know give him some kind of like, police uniform or something. Then again, does Arkham even give out uniforms? I guess it all kind of depends on who's writing it. Sometimes they're wearing like police outfits. Sometimes they're just wearing their normal villain outfits, which I thought was kind of kind of interesting. But yeah, the driver is a Joker, and it looks like he's reformed. No Joker makeup, no nothing like that. And uh, how do you pronounce his name? Napier, Mr. Napier. I think that's how you say it. So Joker, or should I say Mr. Napier? Uh, basically, he tells Batman that uh, I need your help. So we cut to a flashback uh, a year ago, and we see the Batmobile chasing down Joker, who's riding one of those. Ah, oh, damn it! I don't know what the hell those things are called. Bro, like, they're they look like like the hands-free automatic scooters. I see kids riding those stupid things all the time. It, God, that makes me feel old. <laughs> damn you, kids in your automatic scooters! Back in my day. We had to actually pedal if we wanted to get around. <laughs> uh, I'm not even that old. I'm only 31. 31's not old, right? Isn't isn't there like a saying that like 30 is the new 20? I hope that's the case. <laughs> but yeah, I see um I see kids riding those stupid things all the time. And it's kind of funny because uh I usually see them at the park. Because I go, I go to the park every day to walk my dogs and stuff like that. And just for the exercise. And I see kids like doing laps around the park. But they're on those stupid little hands-free automatic scooters. I don't know. I say automatic because they're one of the... Basically, they're the scooters that you just kind of lean forward a little bit. And then it drives itself. Not drives itself. But it drives for you. Like it moves forward for you. Like you don't have to pedal or anything like that. I feel like that kind of defeats the whole purpose of doing laps around the park it's like if you why are you gonna go to the park and do laps around it if you're not even like gonna like do any actual work yourself all you're doing is leaning forward a little bit i don't know whatever <laughs> uh whatever i'd rather see those things in the fucking uh fidget spinners i still have no idea how those things became a thing then again uh I was going to say back in my day, but that just makes me sound old. But I remember back when I was in uh, junior high and freaking yo-yos for some reason became like a huge thing. It was yo-yos and Pokemon cards. Pokemon cards I can get. I can understand why those became huge because Pokemon was a huge fad back then. But yo-yos, I have no idea why the hell yo-yos made a comeback. Yo-yos and then what was the other thing? Uh, Tamagotchis or whatever. <laughs> All right. Uh, so yeah, back to the the comic at hand. They're chasing Joker on one of those hands-free automatic scooters. I'm sure one of you guys are gonna tell me what the actual name for it is. And uh, 
Yeah, he, this he's going super fast. Like, I mean, he's able to actually ride up a drawbridge and leap over to the other side on one of those things. And I'm like, eh, that's got to be like super modified or something because those things go like five mile per hour tops. There's no way they're going to be riding up a bridge. But uh, yeah, Batman is like obsessed with chasing him down. Uh, Barbara is like riding shotgun next to him, kind of like screaming the whole time. And Batman just kind of like ignores her and just rides off the uh, the drawbridge and continues to chase after Joker. And uh, we see Batman like riding on top of rooftops. And Barbara is kind of like, dude, Bruce, there are people living in those buildings. How the hell do you know that like riding on top of it isn't going to cause the roof to cave in? You know, that's something that I've always kind of wondered. What movie was it? I believe it was one of the... Um, was it Batman Begins? It wasn't the dark. Yeah, I think it was Batman Begins, where he rides on top of rooftops, or is that one of the older like campy Batman movies? I want to say it's Batman Begins, but it's been forever since I've seen any of those movies. But yeah, he's like basically rooftop hopping, and I'm like, isn't the uh, Batmobile like basically a mobile tank? I mean, if a tank were to land on top of my roof, it would cave in. So, um, yeah, it doesn't have the uh, the support structure to hold up a Batmobile. So I always thought that was kind of kind of interesting. So I like the fact that they actually addressed that. So uh, Joker's basically says, you know, now let's get like an audience involved. So he rides through a construction site, and Batman basically just fucking rides right through it, chasing after Joker. Doesn't care about the fact that he almost runs over a uh a construction worker um nightwing you know basically has to arrive and save the because save one of the construction workers at the last minute because batman almost almost ran him over i like the fact that uh, joker calls nightwing mullet wing because uh yeah dick does kind of sport a mullet which was just an ugly ass hair so i'm sorry if you have mullets it's just ugh. So yeah, basically even Nightwing is kind of like, dude, what the hell's wrong with Batman? Like, just, ah, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Ah, I don't know. Like, he has like no self-control whatsoever. He's like obsessed with capturing Joker to the point that he's putting like people in harm's way. And it's even confusing uh, Barbara and uh, Dick. So uh, Joker basically runs into this uh, building and Batman chases him in there. And I'm not going to read out the dialogue because um, there is a part of dialogue that I want to read, but it's going to be later on. But basically, Joker is kind of saying how Batman and Joker need each other. Like how they're actually on the same side in a way. That if it wasn't for Joker doing all the crazy stuff that he does, the people wouldn't support Batman the way that they do. So, and the way he's portrayed, it's like Joker is actually doing these things because he... Well, actually, I'll get into that later on because there's a flashback that kind of explains more of that stuff. So uh, when that part comes up, I'll talk more about it. But um, yeah, Joker kind of calls Batman out on the fact that he's being um, he's being very reckless. That's the word I was looking for earlier. Batman's being very reckless and he's like putting like innocent people in harm's way. So basically, we get like a, a fight. I don't even want to really say it's a fight. It's just more of Batman beating the crap out of the Joker. And... Uh, and Batman just basically straight up tells Joker, like, you know, you don't matter to anybody. Like, no one gives a shit about you. Uh, not me, not Gotham, nobody. And I'm like, ouch. <laughs> so Joker kind of lets it rip, too. Basically tells him, like, you know, after all these years, you still have no idea what I'm capable of. I could have beaten you at any point, turned the city completely against you whenever I wanted. But I chose to hold back giving you only what you could handle because I didn't want to wreck what we had. Admit it. I gave you Gotham City. This corrupt war zone is the home we created together. The only reason Gotham allows you to exist is because they're so terrified of me. Admit it. And Batman's like, are you finished? And Joker says, I'm the only one who knows you, Batman. Your vigilantism isn't about justice. It's about control. Fixing the city in your pathetic way of salvaging the broken bits of your anima. But you're too stupid to see that it hasn't worked. Crime has become your therapy and got them your victim. You've dragged us all into your perpetual Halloween. And I was like, oh, holy shit. That's <laughs> that's actually 
Well, I don't know about the second part, even though um, that is true. It's the fact that I think he's actually been touched on a couple of stories. If there was no Batman, Gotham would still not be the safest city ever, but it wouldn't be as crazy as it is. Like, the reason there are so many psychotic villains and stuff is because they're drawn to the city because of Batman. Or at least that's the belief I've always kind of had. You may think, well, you know, there's a lot of corruption got them. Yeah, but it seemed like Jim Gordon was kind of starting to, uh, like, once he became uh, commissioner, he was kind of starting to pull out the the weeds of corruption to kind of quote a little bit of the shadow. And I, I am kind of the impression that... In just maybe a couple more years, uh, Commissioner Gordon would have been able to to basically, I don't want to say get rid of all corruption because there's always going to be crime no matter where. But I think he would have been able to bring it down so it's like, you know, normal level. I don't know. That's always been in my belief. I always felt like Batman kind of was a catalyst for more crime. And not only just more crime, but more crazy crime. Like if Batman wasn't in Gotham, we wouldn't have all these psychos but i also really believe the fact that batman is all about control i've mentioned that in uh in the metal knights videos where that's one of the reasons why i've never liked batman as a character uh i'm gonna sound kind of uh like a broken record here because i've mentioned this multiple times before but i like everything about batman but his character i like his suit i like his gadgets i like his uh vehicles I like his Bat family. I like his villains. I just don't like him as a character. He's very broody, very very melodramatic, very untrustworthy to even his friends. Not untrustworthy in that he acts untrustworthy, but in that he never trusts anybody, really. He's one of those where he has to constantly be in control. Like, he has to basically constantly know everything that's going on, but he doesn't have to tell everybody else what's going on. Like, he doesn't have to keep anybody in the loop, but he always has to stay in the loop. Which just, I, mean, I hate people like that. He's, he's a control freak, basically. And uh, that always kind of bothered me. It's like, who the fuck made you the leader? Especially, even in the Justice League, you kind of try to take control. And it's like, eh, if anyone should be in control of the Justice League, it should be Superman. Because Superman is actually, like, if there's anyone in the Justice League who I can see turning evil, it would be Batman. Even though, I mean, that's not ever going to happen. But I could see Batman easily turning evil before uh, Superman or Wonder Woman does. Which is why I thought Injustice was kind of weird. I would always think it would be like the flip side. Batman would be the... Batman and his, like, is the one that turns evil and he convinces his Bat family to, to join sides with them. And then like Superman and Wonder Woman and Aquaman and all that stuff have to like team up to stop him. But instead they wanted to make Superman the villain. And Batman the hero. I'm kind of getting off topic. But yeah. Like, I can always see, I always saw Batman as being, like, the first of the group to, to switch sides. If that ever were to happen, which it's not. But, yeah, I just, I can't stand Batman because of that. He's, like, a control freak. But, yeah, basically, Joker kind of points all this stuff out. And this is the one that really, like, gets to Batman. It's like, admit it. You can't even build a family because the very thought of one terrifies you. How many innocent children will you ruin with your nightmare? And then uh, Batman just basically tells him to shut up. And Joker continues with, uh, is that Nightwing or Robin? I've lost track because they keep disappearing. Even Gordon is fed up watching his men turn into cannon fodder on the front lines of a war they didn't ask for. And I was like, oh shit. <laughs> Joker's just laying them in. And Batman just basically continues uh, to beat the crap out of Joker. And here's like my favorite one. Face it. The greatest villain in Gotham City is you. <laughs> and uh, basically the lights flash on and we see like all the cops and stuff behind Batman. Like they were there the whole time uh, as Batman was this brutalizing Joker. And Joker uh, holds up uh, basically experimental drugs and says that he will prove that Batman needs him, and he'll prove what he said earlier about how he can turn the city against Batman in a heartbeat. And he's going to prove it with these drugs. And um, they're basically like experimental drugs that would be able to cure Joker. And uh, Batman like swipes them out of Joker's hands, pops the tab open, and then just shoves all the pills into Joker's mouth until he starts like ODing. 
And as this is going on, um, somebody is recording. I'm assuming the person recording is Harley, though we don't really see who it is. It could be someone else, but I'm, I'm going to guess it's Harley. But yeah, uh, <laughs> everyone just kind of looks on in horror as Batman forces the Joker to OD. Um, and then the very next scene, we basically see two reporters talking about the footage of Batman beating up the Joker and then um, forcing him to OD. And uh, basically, it's a new scandal called the Batgate scandal. And they're kind of questioning if if the Batman is actually the hero that the city kind of made him out to be. Basically, we get two sides. We get the woman who's kind of saying that Batman is a monster, kind of, and that the uh, Gotham City Police have kind of enabled Batman to do the stuff that he does, which is, if you think about it, it, against the law. (laughs) Uh, Meanwhile, you have the male reporter who's kind of on Batman's side and kind of saying how um, we kind of need to take the law into our own hands a little bit. Well, not us, but like Batman. Like we need someone like Batman who's willing to cross the line to stop these psychos from committing the atrocities that they do on the people. So while the woman is more calm and the, the guy is more emotional, which I thought is kind of kind of an interesting switch because usually men are more able to control their emotions and women are more emotional. And this isn't like a knock on anything, so don't even try to say I'm attacking any any gender. I'm just pointing out facts here. <laughs> I think that they do they do a nice job here. I mean, there is one piece of line that I don't really like, and that's from the uh, the male when he says, basically the woman was talking about corruption, and how uh, like there's corruption within the GCPD, and then the male reporter brings up uh, that was a previous commissioner. Gordon has been working hard to overturn public opinion. The SJWs need to give him a chance. And that's just kind of like, eh, that SJWs, especially the fact that you bolded it. It seems like you really wanted to bring attention to that word. It doesn't really, well, I guess it, you can say it, it's, I was going to say it doesn't work in that sense, but I guess it could. But I don't know if I would use that word. I wouldn't use SJWs. I don't know. I'd maybe say, uh, his detractors just need to give him a chance or something. I don't know. It's not, it, it doesn't like ruin the story or anything whatsoever. Uh, I think the scene is, it does a pretty good job of portraying both sides. Like even though the, the male kind of comes across more emotional, what he's saying makes sense. And he has a point to everything he's saying. Then again, the female also has a point. So I think this is what, uh, kind of going back to what I was saying earlier, both sides basically seem to be getting like an equal voice. And I like that. It's not like other SJW comics where you basically just get one side and the other side is kind of portrayed as like monsters. <laughs> like you basically get like the SJW side trying to portray itself as heroic, even though they always come across as like literal dictators and fascists, which is funny. Like the whole like SJW side is supposed to be like anti fascist, but they're the ones literally like trying to shut down the, their opposing. Like the opposite voice through uh, violence, which is kind of like, I mean, there are literally like videos of them attacking their opponents. There's videos of them burning signs to say uh, free speech. And it's kind of like, do these people not realize how <laughs> how fascist they actually look? Like they're the ones that are fascist. And even like the reason why I, point, I bring this up is because it even appears like that in the, the comics. Where you will get, like, these SJWs think that they're writing their heroes as heroic. But it's like, you have your heroes, like, arresting civilians before they commit a crime and throwing them into literal gulags. You have, like, Riri Williams taking over a sovereign nation and becoming its queen through violence. But these are supposed to be the good guys. Like, this isn't portrayed as, like, a satire or, like, the heroes are, like, losing their heroic way and kind of dipping their toes into villain villainery. This is literally them, the writers thinking, Oh, you know, our heroes are actually doing heroic things. It's like, but they're not, they're like doing things that like Stalin and, and, uh, and Mao and all that have like, you literally have your characters. 
like I said earlier, you literally have them throwing civilians who haven't committed a crime into gulags. You have them taking over sovereign nations. You have them uh, attacking people just because of their color of their skin, just for being white. I mean, you have freaking the Black Panther and the crew who are literally going undercover to keep white people out of Harlem City. How are they the good guys? Yeah, I, I think this this issue so far it does like a really good job of portraying both sides of like you got the like the SJW. Oh, well, they they call it the SJW, but um, this lady doesn't sound like an SJW. She sounds more this lady report. She sounds more like a liberal. Like she's not SJW. I consider to be basically the hard left, kind of like there's the alt right. I think there's the alt left, which is like the SJWs, like. This theory, like you know, leftist extremist. She doesn't sound like a leftist extremist. She sounds basically like a well-informed liberal, and the other guy is a well-informed, if somewhat emotional, conservative. And both sides are kind of portrayed as very level-headed, and uh, I, I can, I can totally like you can read this and you can I can see people easily siding with the female. I can see people easily siding with the male. I can see people agreeing with both. So I think that's a really good job. I've been talking about that scene for too long. Let's just move on to the next scene. So yeah, we basically got Joker who um who is uh basically in a coma and we got uh Detective Bullock kinda of saying, Well, looks like people are finally kinda of starting to see Batman the way that I have. And uh, I forgot what her name is. Well, I don't even want to say for good because I never knew what her name was to begin with. But the female uh, cop basically kind of like saying how, you know, Batman has saved the lives of dozens of cops, uh, including yours. And Bullock is kind of like uh, allowing a weirdo to fight crime in his underwear. What kind of city lets that happen? And Jim Gordon kind of tries to play it off that, like, you know, the GCPD has nothing to do with Batman. And even Bullock is like, enough with your bullshit, you know. We all know that that's not true. He wakes up and we see he's in prison. So I guess it was, I guess we kind of jumped forward a little bit into the future. Well, not the future, but uh, yeah, we jumped forward from him being in a drug-induced coma to now he's awake and he's in a uh, prison, a prison cell. And he basically, his cell is like littered with a, littered with a bunch of uh, Batman and Joker gadgets and photos and newspaper clippings, and I like that little um, little poster behind Joker, uh, the logo for the Batman animated series, which I will give it props. I actually love that show. I was never, I was never like a huge fan of Batman growing up, but I did absolutely love the hell out of the Batman animated series. It's kind of a shame that a show that came out in the '90s is. I don't want to say it's a shame that it's really good, but I feel like it's almost like a shame that we can't do anything like that now. Or at least Hollywood doesn't seem to be able to write anything that clever in terms of writing. Like you look at all the other Batman shows that they've tried to like really since then, even all the other like superhero shows. I feel like, I don't know. It's almost like they, they think of children as idiots because you know, like all these comic book cartoons... They always feel like they're talking down the kids. And it's kind of like you look at shows from some shows from the 90s, like especially Batman. And I don't feel like Batman did that whatsoever. Like Batman, like kids absolutely loved Batman the Animated Series. But if you look at it, it's almost like it was targeted towards like teenagers and young adults and actual comic book fans rather than the the kiddie audience. But see, that's, that's kind of like the thing. It's, it's kind of that um, if you put out a cool product, product, kids will like, you know, flock to it. But if you put out a product that's like geared specifically towards kids, I feel like kids don't really care for that kind of stuff. Like they feel like they're getting talked down to. I don't know, you use like a wrestling example. Like the biggest era for wrestling was the Attitude Era. And you look at the Attitude Era and the Attitude Era was not kid friendly whatsoever. But I would say you had more kid fans then than you do now. And now that nowadays, like WWE is basically a PG company, um, very kid-friendly uh, product. 
but kids are like not just kids i mean everyone's kind of leaving that company in droves but you don't really see that many kids in the audience either not like it was compared to uh the attitude era i think the reason is because i kind of feel like kids are like they look up to what the like teenagers are into and then they kind of see that as being cool so like i don't know like basically if you have a product geared towards teens young adults by young adults i mean like actual adults in the 20s i don't mean like the ya adults i feel like that's how you get more kids like kids like things that are cool kids don't like things that are basically geared specifically towards them because they kind of feel like they're being talked down to i don't know I'm kind of rambling <laughs> that's how i feel yeah basically we cut to the wayne manor where dick and barbara are telling batman or telling bruce that he's like out of control and that he like you know what the hell's going on with you and bruce kind of tells him like uh bruce kind of ignores him and just tells him that the pills are a mystery and he still hasn't been able to determine what exactly they are for and barbara and dick are kind of trying to tell him like you know you're pushing boundaries that you shouldn't be pushing like answer us why you keep doing shit like that and bruce basically uh, takes him down into uh like the secret room where we see alfred hooked up to a machine and alfred's dying and uh he doesn't know why and alfred has been like this for at least like a month and uh he's basically using freeze technology to try to keep alfred going until he can find a cure but at least now we kind of get a reason why batman is acting the way he does it's because he's stressed out of his mind that he can lose his he can lose his uh father figure and then we cut to uh joker and uh joker kind of notices batman watching him uh outside of his cell and he tells batman he became like batman's like number one fan like he became like <laughs> he basically became like a fanatic and then he realized that he can play the opposite side of batman to bring out the best in batman and so that way the city will see the best in batman and the city will stop being so numb and so accepting of crime and i've heard people compare this to um lego batman joker but i haven't seen that movie yet so i wouldn't know but um even the writer like pointed out that uh after the movie came out he was worried that people were going to call him a uh People were basically going to say that he was ripping off the movie, despite the fact that he actually finished writing the series before the movie ever came out, or before he actually he ever saw the movie, which I I, I believe him, I believe. Uh, I mean, kind of off topic, but I've had uh, the last writing project that I had. I was working with the studio on this one horror script, and we actually ended up having to drop the script because, um, <laughs> as like halfway through the project, we came across a trailer for a movie that's a low budget independent movie that had the same exact plot and even though ours kind of was a little bit different there were some similarities in certain scenes um we were just like yeah we can't do this anymore because it's too similar <laughs> so i can i can totally see stuff like that happening I can totally see him like coming up with this idea for uh, the way he wants to portray Joker, and then all of a sudden a movie comes out and betrays it, like almost the way he he envisioned. So I'm not I'm not calling I'm not saying that he ripped off the uh, the movie because I totally buy his story that he came up with it before he ever saw the movie, because that 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 has happened but to me before. So, but yeah, basically we get the mayor and Jim Gordon talking. And the mayor is obviously upset. We get like a uh, therapist coming in and uh she informs him that jack napier who's uh the joker has made a full recovery uh even had plastic surgery to kind of fix his to make him more normal looking um so in terms of his physic uh in terms of physically he is completely cured um but she's extremely worried about his mental condition and when they ask her why uh basically he spends like he's not he doesn't act the way that Joker used to act. He's a lot more serious, a lot more calm. He spends all his time in the Arkham Library, basically researching the laws and basically preparing for his legal case against the GCPD, uh, Batman and Gotham City. We cut to Arkham where 
Jim Gordon and some of the officers are in a interrogation room and Joker, or should I say Jack Napier, arrives and I guess they're trying to make a deal with Napier so he they he won't sue them. And I, I want to read this dialogue because I like this dialogue. Batman endangered innocent civilians by driving an unlicensed weaponized tank over those rooftops. Then he endangered a construction site by plowing into a cement trunk, injuring three people. He knocked over an innocent guard and trespassed onto private property, destroying thousands of dollars of medical equipment while he assaulted me as I was trying to surrender. Rather than arresting him, you and a dozen police officers stood by while he forced unknown medication down my throat until I stopped breathing. Add that all up, and what do we have? Reckless endangerment, destruction of public and private property, a dozen different traffic violations, assault, and attempted murder by lethal dosage. If you won't arrest Batman, then I have no choice but to file suit against uh, the JCPD to answer for his crimes. And Gordon is like, you know, Batman is in GCPD. And uh, Joker says, of course he is. Even, even if no one wants to admit it, the poof has been right over our heads the entire time. The bat signal kept under GCPD supervision. I found photos of it. That makes you an accessory. And everyone else is like, oh shit. I Joker. <laughs> Joker has pulled a fast one. And this is the reason why I love this panel so much. This, Or should I say this page? Is because I always kind of was like, how the hell are they going to make Joker seem sympathetic? And how are they going to make him like be moral, not morally, but even legally right when, you know, in terms of pitting him against the GCPD and Batman and that right there, like that page, it's like technically Joker is right. And he does have a solid case. And if that were to go to court, Joker would, I can see Joker winning that easily despite all his past crimes. So Jack basically tells them that, you know, like, I love Gotham City and it's time to pay her back for the debt. Uh, basically pay back the debt owed by the Jokers. Uh, and what better way to do that than uh, by me becoming her white knight? I thought, that was kind of, I thought that was kind of interesting. Like, Batman is the dark knight. Uh, Joker's going to be the white knight. But then there's also that, you know, the white knight phrase in terms of SJWs. But uh, yeah, that's how it ends. I am really looking forward to the rest of the series. This is this is an awesome, awesome series that does a really good job of doing social commentary, but not portraying either side as being like a monster or a villain. Like both sides, whether you're on the left or you're on the right, whether you're a liberal or conservative, both sides are kind of portrayed equally. And even the writer has said that while the Joker right now might come across as being more of a on the side of good, by the end of the series, you're going to be rooting for both sides. You're going to be rooting for Joker and Batman. So um, assuming he lives up to that that promise, I think this is going to be an awesome series, especially if, if it keeps up where this, like, you know, if the quality keep uh, remains the same as this, this issue, I can see this being an amazing miniseries. And I heard um, Sean Murphy kind of talking about how this is the Murphy verse, and how more stories might be within this this universe that he created, which I think it would be kind of cool. Like I don't want to see this story become canon, obviously, but I would like to see a, this uh, basically give birth to like different spinoffs and stuff like that set within this specific universe. But yeah, that was Batman the White Knight. Hope you guys enjoyed, and I'll catch you guys all next time. Later.